about the same time Dave was. Carson was in the Army, and um, I can remember all the curse words I ever heard. <laughs> it was even worse than the Navy, right, Jim? You know, once you hear all those words, somehow or other, they never leave your mind. They don't. Now, the trick is not to use them. Especially when things get a little out of hand, you know? <laughs> how, how can we gain victory over things that beset us? There, I have found only one way. I have tried two ways, but have found only one way to work. Let me show you. I'll talk about this in just a minute. One way that does not work, I can guarantee it. Willpower. The human will is wonderful, and it can do much, but it cannot take the carnal heart and make it pure. The leopard cannot change his spots, the Ethiopian cannot change his skin, and neither can you which are accustomed to doing evil do good. I just quoted Jeremiah in case you were wondering. This is impossible. You cannot make yourself pure, Letty. Irvy, Brenton, Willie, you can't do it, no matter how hard you try. God will settle for nothing less than a pure heart. The Bible says the pure in heart will see God. Willpower has its place. Willpower has its function. But willpower cannot make you, give you, produce within you, a pure heart. Now, some people, see if you agree with this, some people come from the womb being predisposed to be a little more righteous than the rest of us. They just don't seem to have all the bad habits. They just don't have all the problems. They don't have all the monkeys on their backs. Some people just seem to be more righteous naturally, don't they? The truth is, we're all damaged and we're all carnal by our birth, come from the womb this way, and God wants this. I've got to tell you this. It's a personal little testimony. It's not a very pretty one, but it, it'll, it'll make the point. I was giving Bible studies in Dallas, Texas in 1973, and, as I, and Mexicana Airlines was having a big promotion advertising low fares to Acapulco. And to make their ads attractive, they had on Interstate, um, what is that, 35 that runs through Dallas? And they had on the interstate that I had to drive by about every other day. They had a, they had a sign that was 90 feet wide. It, it's, you know, twice as big or a, a third larger than they, I think they're usually 60. This was 90. It was huge. And what they had on this sign, li lying on her side, was a naked woman. I think she wore three lilies. It was the most amazing poster I had ever seen. <laughs> Here I am driving to a Bible study. <laughs> the devil will stop at nothing to entice you into sin. And I have to drive by this. We lived, we lived south 
And the only way to get to the north part of town was up to go up Central Expressway, and to get over there, you had to go Interstate 35. And, and you know, the giant naked woman. <laughs> oh, man. And I remember thinking to myself, I know, it's, I know that God is not pleased when we dwell and focus on sexual immorality. Because that's basically what the advertisement was all about. There is something about a naked woman that dilates the eyes of men. <laughs> How many of you men will admit that? The rest of you are liars. Studies have been done repeatedly on this topic that placing naked women before the eyes of men will cause the pupils to dilate. There is a physiological response. The devil knows it. Believe me, he knows it. And he works at every angle he can to destroy men. I would drive by and I'd try to look at the speedometer. I'd drive by in the left lane. It's funny now. It, it was, how, how can you avoid the temptation? How can you avoid the attraction? And I believe now that I look back on it, I'm, I'm glad that, that it was placed there because it taught me the first lesson in overcoming sin that I needed to know. And that lesson was this. Unless the victory is accomplished through the Spirit, it is neither permanent nor, or long-lasting. The problem, see, was my carnal nature. And I was forced to admit I cannot change it on my own. Willpower will not change it. I began to pray, Lord, you've got to change my nature, because that's where the problem rests. You've got to help me to see this for what it really is, rather than to consider that it's just a moment of pleasure. Help me to see and to have the attitude of what it really is. Let me see sin for what it really is. And by the power of the Spirit, not by the power of Larry, I came to where I had no interest in looking at that billboard. It was the Spirit that changed within me. Now I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit changed everything at once. It was, that was just one test. And I learned a valuable lesson. And the Holy Spirit was nagging me about this whole process because what God wanted to reveal in me was His power to do the impossible. Amen. This doesn't make me righteous. I'm still a sinner. But it does teach me something about what God wants to do within. And when faced with temptation... When struggling with temptation, the only way to overcome it is through the Spirit. If you wrestle with God on your knees, Lord, take this from me. Take this desire from me. I know it's wrong. I know it's wrong. Take it from me. I can't take it from myself. That's where victory begins. By faith. You see, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. I discovered, this is, the, this is a critical point, I discovered that until I'm willing to admit something is sin, I have really no assurance of power to overcome it. You have to be willing to say to yourself, this is sin. When that Holy Spirit starts nagging, that guilt starts coming, you have, you've got, you, you will resolve it pretty quickly. You'll either put it on the back burner and go on to other things, or you'll resolve, this, resolve it with the Spirit and make it like the Spirit wants it. That's the way we work. We all work that way. Let me give you another example. What does the Tenth Commandment say? Thou shalt not what? Covet. What does that word mean? To want something someone else has or owns. Or desire. Want. Thirst. Appetite. To want, desire, something. You have a copy of what that was. Advertising is built all around the idea that you can induce people to covet. If I can present something to you in the right light that you have, un that you have not known of before, I can induce you to want it, desire it. Why do you think catalogs are mailed out so overwhelmingly? Why do you think advertisers spend billions of dollars? What are they after? What are they trying to do? Make you want something their product. They want your money, you want their product. That's what advertising is all about. And the most skillful advertising is advertising that produces results. We live in a world that is designed to produce dissatisfaction. No one has contentment with what they have. Everybody wants something more. What we have is never enough. We keep wanting more and more and more. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Are you really content with what God has given you? Are you really happy with what you have? Are you really pleased with what God has bestowed upon you? Or are you driven for more? Now, I'm not talking about excellence in our work. I'm not talking about endeavoring to advance whatever our responsibilities are. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the appetite of the heart. The appetite of the heart. Are you, are you happy? You know, Zig Ziglar says, God will give you all the money you can possibly manage. If you don't believe it, notice how much you have. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful statement? Look what he's given you. Now, are you managing your assets? Are you managing your time? Are you managing your little world to the glory of God? That's a, that's a fair question. The Bible says, to him that knoweth to do wrong and doeth it anyway, to him it is sin. Oops. No, it doesn't say that. It says, to him that knoweth to do right and doeth it not. 
You see, there is the sin of commission and the sin of omission. There's, there's both kinds. When we come to face to face with sin, there is only one way out, and that is on our knees, asking God for the power to overcome. Seven times in the book of Revelation, the scripture says, to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh. Now, Alvin, what God calls you to overcome may be different than what he calls me to overcome. Your tests and trials may be dislike mine. We don't have the same kind of life in the same circumstances, but they're the same general principles that work. By willpower, we fail. <coughs> Through willpower, <coughs> one of the biggest areas for struggling with willpower is in New Year's resolutions. Have you ever seen one yet that worked? Huh? I'll tell you why they don't work. Because people will not confess what is sin so that they can go to the Spirit and get the power to overcome it. This will not work. This is why New Year's resolutions fail. I'll do this. I'll do this. Yeah, you can do it for 30 days. But that's the end of that. So, through the Spirit. Now, I want to explain something to you. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit in these remaining moments of our study tonight. I've, I've, I've covered three or four things now I would like to have you consider. All around this world, there are people in every nation, kindred, and tongue who live according to the Spirit, who follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, who know the Spirit's nagging in their life, who listen and respond to the Spirit's call. Some of them are Muslims, some of them are Jews, some of them are even pagan. Some of them are Catholic, some of them are Protestants, some of them are Hindus. As a matter of fact, a lot of them are Hindus, about a billion. What I'm trying to get you to understand is that all over this world there are people who follow the Spirit because the Spirit speaks to all. In, in Joel, chapter 2, the Bible says in the last days that God is going to pour out His Spirit on how many people? And that means what? Everybody, everywhere. All people. And the Spirit is going to speak to everybody, everywhere. What is the Spirit going to say? Well, the Spirit is going to be working through the 144,000. The Holy Spirit's going to be giving the gospel proclamation throughout the world. And I'm going to try to explain something to you that is most beautiful to me. God is going to, you've heard me talk about this many times, about the Sabbath rest test. You've heard me talk about that. How that we're going to see the Sabbath proclaimed in every country, in every language, in every nation, and in every population. Why is the Sabbath so important? What did I say about it last night? It was a sign of what? God's unilateral covenant. The Sabbath is a sign of God's unilateral covenant. And the circumstances during the Great Tribulation are going to be set up in such a way that the only way that we will be able to keep Sabbath is through faith. Right? Okay? Now watch this. When the gospel during this time period is preached in China, let's just take China for a moment, we're at roughly one and a quarter billion people there. When the Sabbath is promoted and, and proclaimed in China, those who live by faith and know the working of the Spirit are going to receive the truth and rejoice 
and implement it in their lives through the power of the Spirit because they already know this. Those in India, those in Russia, those in America, what God is going to demonstrate to the universe and to, the, and to our world is that his salvation will save anyone who lives by faith. People who are cultivating, listening to the Spirit, people who have open hearts to hear what the Spirit says, when the truth and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit comes, when this is proclaimed, you're going to be amazed at what the Spirit produces. It will be a harvest that is numberless, a multitude which no man can number, that come out of the great tribulation. What this demonstrates is something that Joe and I was talking about this afternoon. That people, God has people in every language, in every religion, in every nation on earth who understand the Spirit. Now, they may not understand everything quite like I do or like you do, but God doesn't require that. Salvation comes by faith. And when we live up to all that the Spirit leads us to do, God says that is a demonstration of faith and I save people on the basis of faith, so consider that person saved. Give him the righteousness of Christ. This is how, now listen closely, when we get to heaven, we will not all be in agreement about religion. You're going to sit down with a Muslim, and it's going to take a while to sort things out. A thousand years. Good, good start. You're going to sit down with the Hindu. It's going to take a while to work things out. I want to, I want to do something here. There's a text I wanted to look up. Um, just a second here. Here we go. Let's read verse 1, Revelation 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal. That's even without a water purifier. Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. Okay, the water of life, this great river, clear as crystal, flowing down the middle of the of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. This is a tree that bears different fruit every month. Now watch this next part of the verse. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of what? What does that sentence mean? It means this. God's children are going to gather once a month around the tree of life. They will sit under its shade and get acquainted with each other and with Jesus. And in the shade of the tree of life, the great divisiveness of the nations of the world brought back from the Tower of Babel. The great dispersion of the peoples of the earth into languages and cultures and groups will all be reunited and once again brought into one loving family under the tree of life. The leaves will produce the shade which we will sit and learn of God's love and His salvation. 
Isn't that precious? And what is now a very diverse family? Abraham, remember, is promised to be the father of many nations. And for a while, when we get there, there will be many nations. But ultimately, I like the way the Bible puts it, there will be a healing of all the nations. And we will be, there will be one Lord, one faith, and one body. God is so neat. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. Remember, I, was, I haven't talked here about the mark of the beast and the tattoo on the forehead, but you've heard that before. We've covered all those things in other seminars. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will, they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Dear friends, we are about to enter a new age. It will be a very short age. It is the age of the working of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh. We're going to see a gathering of, in of a great harvest that is numberless. We're going to see people who are victorious over the beast. In Revelation 15, look at this. John says, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. Seven angels with the seven last plagues last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire standing beside the sea are those who had been victorious, who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. And they held harps given to them by God and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways king of the ages. This group of people standing there had been victorious over whom? That, in, that tells us when did they live? During the great tribulation. And they're singing this song of praise. Now let me take one last text here. Go to Isaiah 60 verse 21. I talked to you from the first, from the beginning of our, I've talked to you about from the beginning the promise given to Abraham. Why would any Christian want to be an heir of Abraham? Well, here's the bottom line. God says, the time is coming when all of your people will be what? And they will possess what? For how long? They are the shoot I have planted the work of my hands for the display of my splendor. The least of you will become a thousand and the smallest a mighty nation. I am the Lord. Now watch this. In its time, I will do this swiftly. I will do it quickly. The day is coming when all of God's people through the power of the Spirit will be declared righteous. Jesus says, the, di the time is coming when I'm going to write my laws in their hearts and minds. The time is coming when I'm going to make this a new covenant with them. No longer will one man say to another, know the Lord, for you will all know me. Remember we read that from Hebrews. The time is coming when God is going to impart the new nature. The struggle with sin will be over. The victory will be secure. And those that we just read in Revelation have, main, have, have maintained that faith and gained the victory over the beast and over his image. We face the most strenuous test ever put before mankind. 
This is why I wanted to speak on righteousness by faith. Because if you can take something from this seminar that will enable you to live by faith now, learn now that you can, can walk down the street not knowing where you're going and knowing that God is directing you, if you can see how that works now, you will be prepared to stand then. There's a phenomenon when you go down the river. The end of the river is always right in front of you. Have you ever noticed that? When you're in the boat going down the river, the end of the river is always there until you get there. And then when you get there, oops, it goes this way. Or it goes that way. Walking by faith is going down the river. The end is always in sight until you get there. And then it moves. Dear friends, if you will take hold of God's hands, if you will take hold of what He offers through the Spirit, if you will take hold and let Jesus do for you what you can't do for yourself, you will have peace through your faith, and most of all, you will receive the righteousness of Christ, which is promised to all who live by faith. And every night when you go to sleep, you can have the full assurance of God's salvation. I go to sleep every night thanking God for something I don't have. Salvation. I don't have it. In this pocket, there's only this. You can search my room. It's not there. You can search my house. It's not there. I do not have salvation. I have the assurance. And with God, that's just as good as the real thing. Abraham looked up at the stars at night and God said, count them if you can, Abraham, because that's the number of your offspring. And the Bible says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he didn't even have one kid. I go to bed thanking God for the assurance of salvation. Don't you? Well, tonight we're going to be favored with special music. Rick uh, and... Um, Johnny and Carson and Jane sang the little song, He's Coming. Wait on, wait, wait on the Lord. And we've had requests to, have to, to hear it again. So tonight we're going to close with this special music and then I'll close with prayer. So if we can get you guys all to the piano and get you ready, we will enjoy the closing song.